name is Andrew Stotts and I'll be your host as we continue our journey into the teachings of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Today, I'm continuing my discussion with David P. Langford, who has devoted his life to applying Dr. Deming's philosophy to education, and he offers us his practical advice for implementation. Today's topic is the role of challenge in intrinsic motivation. David, take it away. Hello, Andrew. Good to be back. Good to see you. So how challenging is challenge? That's uh, really what we're after about here today. So uh, this is part four in a five-part podcast series we've been doing on intrinsic motivation. And so when I first uh, encountered the concept of intrinsic motivation is actually when I was getting my undergraduate degree and I was, I was so intrigued about it. But um, even like today, uh, there was no training in it. There was no, no real, you know, that was just, you know, here it is. And yeah, intrinsic motivation is really good. So, you know, good luck with that. And uh, all the training was around extrinsic motivation and how to motivate people. And it's the same today, you know, um, I get calls and I get emails and stuff and people always want to know, you know, can't we use bonuses and can't we use this? And uh, you can, you can use those kinds of things. I always think of the phrase that the phrases that Dr. Deming had, he said, uh, the destruction has to start somewhere. <laughs> and people would ask him about those kinds of things like, yeah, you could do that, but it, you know, you're, you're on the road to destruction. So, you know, I've been trying to explain um, the five researched key elements of intrinsic motivation that Deming talked about and how do you actually change a system, whether that's a business or a school or a classroom or whatever it might be. So you have people becoming more intrinsically motivated. So, We've gone through uh, a couple. So we've talked about control or autonomy in the situation. We talked a lot about in, in podcast number two about cooperation and then uh, podcast number three is support. And now we're gonna talk about uh, the role of challenge in intrinsic motivation. Mm. So it's, it's not so easy as just to like flip the switch and say, okay, now we're gonna intrinsically motivate people. Uh, it is a complex, uh, a thinking that has to take place in management um, to create an environment where people can be intrinsically motivated, right? Yeah. And uh, usually if you find people looking like they're not motivated, uh, you know, Deming talked about probably 94 to 98% of the reason they're not being, they're not motivated to come to work is the work itself, the job, you know? So when we start to talk about challenge um you want to think about the job itself is is the job that you say you're having a student do you know if i if i tell people memorize these 10 spelling words for friday well yeah for yeah for some students that could be really challenging for every for others it's just sheer boredom mm. of you know why why are we doing this where did this come from there's no there's no real challenge to it so you can take just about anything that you have, you want people to do. And in fact, a dimming was actually a master of this. You know, he went into some of the most mundane manufacturing places in the world where people are just sitting all day long and doing the same darn thing over and over thousands of times and, and you know, and then leaving. And then how, how do you motivate those people? Well, let's, let's, let's just pay them more. Or let's do this or that or the other thing. And, you know, it didn't work. And the Hawthorne studies, showed that, you know, yeah, oh yeah, you could turn the lights off and productivity goes up, or you could turn the lights on productivity, or you have music, or you can do all these kinds of things. But what they discovered was that it was the fact that management actually cared <laughs> that made the difference. And they were right. actually doing, trying to do something to improve the working environment is right. what was really discovered through that. But Deming was the master of going in and teaching people to uh, use their brains and, and to begin to improve their own situation. And that's, that's a challenge, right? I'm sitting here doing this all day long, the same tedious task all day long, but all of a sudden somebody gives me the keys to improve this situation, make a change here, do something. And that's where, you know, PDSA came from or originally PDCA with Dr. Shuhart, 
but plan, do, study, act, make a plan, you know, do it, study it and, you know, act on it, you know, did it work. It'd be just that simple of, of a process. Now, if we get together with a few other people and we study the process of what's happening and we're given the authority or the control or autonomy, like we talked about earlier, to actually make a change, ah, well, that's pretty challenging. That's, that's pretty interesting. And in my work with education over and over and over, when I go in and start working with people and teaching them the same kind of concept, right? You're, <clears throat> uh, I hear all the time uh, administrators saying that, you know, we got dead wood on our staff or, uh, you know, we got people that just don't care or, you know, well, it's probably because you taught them to do that <laughs> or somebody previously taught them to do that because that's not normal if people are acting like that, et cetera. And yes, they have to make money and yes, they have to live. And so they'll just learn to, you know, quit work, but keep the job. <laughs> and I'll show up, I'll show up every day and do what I'm supposed to, but it doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, put any extra effort in or any thinking or anything else. So. I can imagine a listener or a viewer listening to this and thinking to themselves, yeah, let's do a challenge. Let's do a competition. <laughs> yeah. not, not realizing that when you're talking about challenge and we're talking about intrinsic motivation, it's not about a challenge to compete for a spelling contest or something. It's a different type of challenge. So tell us more about what kind of challenges people would respond to. Yeah, so some of the ways that you can get challenge into a mundane task or a situation is you want to think about excitement. You know, how can I bring a, a level of excitement in uh, to this situation? And well, how do you, you know, how do you get excitement going? Well, you have to think about the level of difficulty, right? Mm. And so <clears throat> in neuroscience, there's actually sort of a learning zone. So too much challenge. Uh, I'm going to be overwhelmed. You know, I'll, I'll be frustrated. I'll get the deer in the headlights look. I just can't, can't do anything. Uh, too little challenge. I got boredom <laughs> going on. Mm. So there's a learning zone where the challenge has to be just right. And the problem, especially with teachers, is teachers are always trying to assess that with the students that, that they're working with, right? They, they, they're trying to set the level of challenge. But what I learned over the last 40 years is uh, the only person that can really know what is challenging is the individual themselves. Even like kindergarten, first grade, second grade students know if something is challenging or not. And, uh, and when you set up a situation where they can sort of choose the level of challenge uh, involved with that, you get a level of excitement that you didn't uh, get before because the level of difficulty is there. So I think we talked a little bit in one of the previous podcasts about uh, gaming and video games and, you know, so many education institutes, you know, institutions, you know, want to, they want to ban gaming and they want to ban all this kind of stuff. But why are those things so addicting? <laughs> why are kids spending so much time on that? Because they're setting the level of challenge, hmm. right? They're setting the level of excitement that they can handle. And if they go up too many levels too fast, this game becomes so overwhelming and so difficult that they just can't cope with it, right? And so they'll end up just quitting or backing down a level or, or two until they sort of master that and move forward. So creating, a, you know, being cognizant of that level of difficulty and getting the individual to understand how to set that level of difficulty is, uh, is where it's really at. Um, I remember the story of, uh, um, I'm sure I think secretary of state with, uh, I think it was Nixon administration or something. Kissinger. Anyway, there was some, yes, Kissinger, you got it. Yes. <laughs> See, there's a level of challenge for you. Yes. You, don't, you yes. win. So, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Kissinger uh, <clears throat> wanted some kind of a plan or a military plan or something from one of the generals about something that they were doing or whatever, and gave him a timeline. And so the general came back with a plan, and Kissinger listened patiently to the plan and said, General, is that the best you can do? General thought for a while and said, Well, actually, no, I, you know, given the time and resources we had, et cetera, 
we thought, well, at this, you know, this is the best we could do. Well, once you go back and relook at it and, you know, do mm-hmm. it again and, and see if that's the best you could do. Well, general came back, I think two or three more times. And each time, uh, you know, Kissinger said, you know, general, is that really the best you can do? And finally the general said, by golly, we worked on this. And I believe this is the best we could do at this point in time. And Kissinger said, okay, that's all I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read it. That's right. I really wanted to know. So <laughs> even in schools, kids learn to play the game of learning really quick. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you get through school by giving a teacher what they want? Right. Right. You don't get through school if you're super innovative or you get through school, but you're not going to probably get the A's and, and, and master stuff. If you're actually being innovative all the time and thinking outside of the box. And um, I think it was even Einstein got a D in physics or math or something because he kept challenging. Yeah, he kept challenging the, the the teacher's theories all the time. Well, you know, that's that's not the way to get through school, you know. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. you want to give people the answers they expect, right? Yeah. Um, um I have a, that's the level of challenge that we're talking about. Right. I have a experience when I was 18 and um I went to work in this factory and it was a plastic molding factory back when plastic molding was done in America. And uh, it was a very mundane job. And uh, I would go crazy all day long, you know, waiting for the break and, and just, just, it would just drive me nuts. And I would be thinking about stuff all the time. And the way the company did is they gave us three months. And at the end of three months, they'd tell us whether they're going to keep us or not. And I started the job with an, a couple of other guys. Some of them didn't survive, but this one guy did survive. And it was the night before we had the, the decision date. And I said, I asked him, you know, we were talking about it and he asked me, what, what do you think? I said, man, I hope they don't offer me a job because this is just <laughs> going to kill me. This is just, there is no challenge in this job. And I was I like, I don't care how much they pay me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which I felt like must be the same answer that he was going to give, but he gave a very different answer. He said, oh, I hope I get this job. And I was like, well, why? And he said, because I just, I like it. I like, I know exactly what to do. I don't have to bring the job home. You know, I'm not facing all this stress and, you know, I can deal with that. And that was a wake up call. When I later became a supervisor at Pepsi, I, I was able to understand that different people have different uh, objectives of, from work and different things that they want from it. And some people want a big challenge and some people don't necessarily. So my question to you is, how do you handle different people that have different willingness or desire to take on challenge? Yeah, and, and Deming, Deming talked about that a lot in his seminars too. And uh, one of the responses I re- often remember was he said, you know, some sometimes people are just not in the right job, right? <clears throat> so, you know, maybe there's another job within the company that would be much more challenging for them, much, you know, because everybody has their own expertise that they bring mm. to a situation, whether that's in a classroom or a job or management or whatever it might be, uh, people have this level of expertise and maybe you're not just, you're just not being challenged to use your level of thinking and background and expertise in a new way. But in this Um, case, that guy may not, I don't know if that would have changed anything because what he was looking for from the job was not necessarily challenged. He wasn't a bad employee. In fact, he got the job in the next day. uh, Well, there's, there's, Two different kinds of stresses, right? There's mm-hmm. use stress and there's distress, right? So use stress is when you are challenged by the job and you're like, oh yeah, this is great. You know, this right. job's really challenging, you know, and I gotta figure this stuff out and I gotta work through this. Or distress, like these people are trying to kill me. Or, you know, this is uh this is no fun for me. I don't, I don't, I don't like this at all. I just mm. it's not something I want to be doing, right? So a manager has to be acutely aware of who they're working with. And, it, and part of it com- happens in the, in the hiring process. Are you asking the right press questions? And, you know, we have the phrase, uh, the phrase, you know, do you have the right people on the bus? Yeah. Well, do you, do you actually know what the bus is? <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you really want them to be doing? So. Yeah, in fact, the person that was in trouble in that case was me. They probably, you know, if, if I had an education and I had more, you know, understanding of the world, I could have said, hey, could I try something else? But I didn't, I didn't have that understanding. 
Um, one of the things I was thinking about that you said earlier that made me think about this situation was also that there's one thing that 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 other guy would respond to, and that is identifying errors or mistakes or problems because everybody's frustrated by that because they got to repeat their work and you know they just don't like that so you could i guess argue that in fact continuous improvement is something that people you know will be uh feel the excitement of that challenge about yeah i I, i've encountered that with educators as well i've had teachers just come up and tell me flat out, you know, I, I don't want to have to think, you know, just tell me what to do and I'll go do it. Right. The problem with that is all of a sudden you're faced with say 30 students coming from random variation in the system coming in. And all of a sudden you're challenged with uh, dealing with a level that you've never had to deal with before. Right. And if you haven't learned to think and and change and adapt and and, and understand that situation, you're just going to blame the individuals. You know, we we just we just need some new kids here, right? Well, that's that's like you get that's you're you're in a band and you get feedback from the audience that you know what you're doing really sucks, and you're thinking, well, I just need a different audience. <laughs> 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 so. And that's uh, so, why I go to talk to my mom because she always <laughs> applauds. Yeah, there you go. So another way we can get challenged is through just novelty. Mm -hmm. um, so so too, not, too much sameness uh, does the opposite of, of challenge and puts people into boredom and stuff. I always tell people, you know, um, if you don't believe me, just go to a, a, a local church and watch what happens after about 20 minutes of one method one person talking, everybody just sitting there listening, and then you start to see a whole audience of people nodding their heads in agreement, but really they're just trying to keep their heads, their eyes open, right? And it's the same thing in the classroom, you know, past 10 minutes, if you're doing the same lecture format, the same thing all the time, um, there's no novelty there. There's nothing to look forward to. There's no challenge or, I remember I was in a master's degree statistics class and it was a three hour class, two times a week at night. Mm. And the first class was just all lecture. This guy lectured on statistics and, and so everybody got it. And I remember it was not a very big class. It was only about 12 students, but the next class, there were only half as many there. And when it got ready to start the class, these people would all get their tape recorders out and just punch all these tape recorders because the students all realize that there's no point in me sitting here, you know, mm -hmm. if that's all we're going to do is just sit and listen for three hours. Right. And, uh, and the professor didn't care either. Yeah. Didn't care if you're there or not. <laughs> so that's um, kind of the opposite of challenge. When I see those heads nodding in my classroom, I always basically say, everybody come up to the board. I'm going to show you something. And then I just do the next lecture with everybody standing. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's really good. So how do you get novelty? You can get novelty through music, adding color, and what you just described, adding movement. Yep. Ch change the situation and then watch how the behavior changes instead of leaving the situation alone and expecting a different behavior, which is, you know, insanity yep. kind of a thing. So you're exactly right. As soon as you see that, you should be changing the situation immediately, you know, do I'm, something I'm, different. I'm, I've been teaching an ethics class and that's kind of known for being really sleepy. So what I do is I created a, uh, this is going to sound kind of funny, a cheat sheet for my ethics class. But uh, basically I teach a little bit and then I tell the students, okay, write this down on your cheat sheet. So they have to do a physical activity. And then after that, we go back to a little bit of a lecture and then I say, okay, now take a quiz question. Then they do that and then we look at the scores and see what they understood what they did and and basically by doing this type of thing I'm, I'm trying to bring variety novelty is the word you use and uh yeah that and if i didn't do that in that topic it's going to be all sleepy sleepy heads now uh, uh, sometimes people interpret that as oh, oh we're going to do an icebreaker now that's not novelty mm. uh, that's just a lot of people just look at that and just say oh 
just skip the icebreaker, right? Yeah. But you have to yeah. bring novelty to the learning situation. So I remember when I, I was in college, I had a, a class called the Assassinate, Assassination of American Presidents. Fantastic class. Mm. But I, I remember one time we were talking about eyewitness accounts in, in murder cases and assassinations like that. And while the professor starts to talk about this and he and he's going through his points and stuff, probably could never do it today. But these two people burst into the room with masks over their heads, demanded something from the professor and actually got one of the students and pulled them out of the classroom with them, et cetera. And then while everybody's sitting there in panic, the professor says, OK, I want you to take out a piece of paper, write down everything that you saw. 80% of the students in that class swore up and down that these two masked individuals had guns and, and uh, you know, were holding people hostage, you know, and then they had, he had the mask people come back in. None, none of us got it right. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the adrenaline was there and his novelty and all this kind of stuff. But it turns out these two guys had bananas in their hands, you know, but we were all sure that they were guns and, but, you know, that that's the problem with, with that. But that was so novel that every time you went to class, there was something. And then by the third class, you, you're kind of wary, you know, that there, there's some trick. Is there some trick to this or not? Or but still you're paying attention because there's something going on there. Hmm. Another way to make uh, get it challenging is to make sure it's compelling. You know, and Deming talked a lot, a lot about the purpose of, of an organization and the aim, et cetera. But is the work more compelling than just the work itself? You know, you think about uh, like building the space shuttle is a good example. Hmm. Well, I, I'm not just putting in rivets <laughs> in the side of this space shuttle. I'm actually creating something that's, you know, a national heritage and we're doing something that's never been done before. And Right. The, the work is compelling. Right. In that sense. Also think about uh, I think Deming talked one time about uh, most of the work in manufacturing during World War II is being done by women. Because men were in, in the army yep. for the most part, and uh, they worked in teams, they communicated, they had fun in their work, but the, uh, the work was also compelling. You knew you were actually building that airplane for your uncle in the South Pacific. Right. And if you had errors in it or problems that that plane wasn't going to fly right, you could be, you know, your family member could be in trouble. Mm. So sometimes that has to be explicit that we have to understand how to make work compelling. Yeah. And um, I'm going to wrap it up. And then I want to, I want to also hear a kind of final word from you about a challenge to the listeners and the viewers to think about how to make yep. things compelling. But let me go through a couple of things that, that we learned from this discussion. Um, of course, we're at part four of five part of intrinsic motivation. And right now we're talking about the idea of challenge. And what was interesting that you said from the beginning was that we don't get any training on intrinsic motivation. We get all this training on extrinsic motivation. Okay, here's how you do this, and here's how you do the scores, and here's how you do the competition. And what you also said is that, you know, it takes some complex thinking to think about creating an environment of challenge. And you also mentioned that, you know, too, too much challenge for some people could be overwhelming, and too little would be boredom. And so you've got to try to judge that for the students and people involved. And then you talked about also different types of stress and how does, you know, how are people responding to that stress? And I think that, you know, when I think about that, I think about a lot of managers just want to deliver stress. You didn't hit your numbers or whatever. Yeah. And, and then, and then just to wrap it up, um, you know, you talked about the idea of how novelty in, you know, making things not the same all the time, whether it's music, color, motion, whatever that is can bring some excitement and some challenge and then i think you you wrapped it up with what really brings the most powerful um, challenge is to understand the aim or the purpose of what you're doing 
And that purpose basically is what can raise your level of challenge. So um, if there's anything to add, please add it. And otherwise, let's give everybody a little challenge to bring challenge into their classroom starting from after listening to this podcast. Yeah, I'd say just the last thing I'd, I would add to that is that um, you can get a, always get a level of challenge by having creativity involved in the process. So we're studying the Pythagorean th theorem in, in mathematics. And so the creativity is you're, you're to go home and apply the Pythagorean theorem in some way and come back and present it to the rest of the class. Mm. Well, that's a much different challenge than do problems A through <laughs> Z, right? And uh, just come back with, the, you know, the answers. But thinking about introducing a level of creativity into the work is, is very challenging, so. So what would be a challenge for the listeners that they could bring into their own life, their own classroom, their own workplace? It, it really, yeah, it really doesn't matter what workplace we're talking about, but if you, once you understand that these are the factors that create intrinsic motivation, you can start looking at your environment and say, okay, you know, how could I make this more challenging? Could I add a level of excitement to this that was probably never even there before? level of novelty or could I make this work compelling, you know, or create or, or add creativity. Um, I grew up on a farm in Colorado and I used to sometimes hate that I'd be, I have to go out with my father to build a fence or something. And one of the th first things he would say is, you know, okay, so what are we trying to do here? Just tell me what to do. Well, what are we trying to do here? And we go through this now. And then why do we need to build the fence in this way? Okay, well, because if stock gets out, and what happens if stock gets out? And he was doing the five whys mm. stuff just intuitively. And but after a few years, he could just say, "Hey, you know, go out and build this fence because you know how to do it." And the challenge was much greater, you know, of figuring it out on my own and having to work that through. Right. So even something so simple as that can have a level of challenge to it. So think about how you can make just about anything you do challenging. Great challenge for all of us. You know, what is the purpose of what we're doing? And let's bring that out. Well, David, on behalf of everyone at Deming Institute, I want to thank you again for your discussion. And for listeners, remember to go to Deming.org to continue your journey. And listeners can learn more about David at LangfordLearning.com. This is your host, Andrew Stotz, and I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Deming. People are entitled to joy in work. <laughs>